Oh, there we are. Well, good morning, everyone. This morning, I'm speaking on the healing journey. Uh, there's a song uh, that I love that's on Bonnie Raitt's new album, which I've been listening to a lot, and it's the title cut. And it's called Just Like That. And Bonnie wrote this song about um, a true story that she heard on the news. And it's a story of a mother who could not overcome grieving her son's death. She couldn't um, overcome blaming herself in some ways for not being there for him. And she grieved for many years. And then one day, a young man came and knocked on her door. And she opened the door, and she had an interaction. She normally wouldn't let in a stranger, but there was something about him, something in his eyes that made her feel at ease and that inspired trust. And so she, she invited him in. He came in and sat down, and he shared with her, he took a deep breath, and he shared with her that he had spent years trying to find her so that he could thank her because he had been the recipient of her son's heart. <laughs> he had received her son's donated heart right after his passing. And the young man invited the mother to put her head on his chest and listen to her son's heart. <laughs> and she sobbed, and she felt such a healing after so long by the grace of what was happening. And the young man thanked her for the life that she had given both her son and him. And I mean, it's just such an incredibly touching true story. And the song about it is so powerful, and I'm learning it um, for the concert that we're going to have next month, our, our Harvest Our Dreams concert. But, you know, this story, we're, we're buoyed when we, when, we, when we hear, when we witness each other's journey of healing. And when something happens, when grace happens, and our heart can open back up to the merciful moments of life, you know, by those moments of grace, when we feel the presence of love and kindness and redemption. And, you know, to, to hear this story... We feel hope. We feel that healing is possible, is always possible, um, no matter what. If everyone could mute, that would be great. Thank you. So in this story, um, the mother had blamed herself for a long time. You know, she didn't believe she was worthy of happiness until this young stranger came along and thanked her for his life. And it was that, that kindness and that gratitude from him that made her healing journey possible to begin, to begin, right? So, you know, it's a mystery. Call it grace. You know, when, when we arrive at that moment where we begin to heal, where we choose in earnest, we're ready for our healing path to begin, our journey to begin. And there are so many ways to heal. There's so much, you know, on the healing journey. We might, it might be, you know, that we have a need for emotional healing from a long ago trauma, or it, it might be a physical healing. You know, I shared with you a few weeks ago, my best friend had a brain tumor, and she just had surgery this week. She had surgery on Wednesday, and I'm so grateful to report that She's doing really well. She's recovering really well. In fact, she wrote a very, very long email to me <laughs> last night. And she's talking. She's writing. Um, she's got a really good prognosis. But I remember, you know, I talked to her right before surgery, and she just amazed me with her inner peace, with her acceptance of what was happening and her attitude. And she told me, she always has so many, many pithy teachings to offer, but she told me, that, you know, when sh she would ask herself, you know, before surgery, um, you know, how am I doing if it weren't for the thoughts in my mind? Such a great question. Because just asking that question, how, how am I doing if it weren't for the thoughts in my mind, 
just helps us take our identification off our, our mind, sometimes our monkey mind, our runaway mind, take our I identification off of that and place it on the inner presence that is at peace already, that is peace. You know, and that can then compassionately observe the mind and see that the mind's like a little child that needs guidance. You know, the mind is a great servant. It's not a great master. We need to take the reins of the mind and guide it, right? And, you know, sometimes we're worrying and we're anxious and we need to take the reins of the mind and guide it into peace, like we just did in that meditation. The other thing my friend said is she would ask herself, um, you know, when she was suffering, is this necessary suffering or do I have a choice? Such a great question. You know, because often our suffering comes from ruminating. And ruminating, ruminating is a mental habit that can be changed. When we ask that question, you know, it, you know, is the way I'm suffering necessary? Then, you know, we might see that actually I, I don't have to think this way that's making me suffer. I can change my view and my suffering dissolves. I do have a choice. I have a choice here. You know, so I, you know, if I could share an evening sitting by the fire with you, you know, I know you could tell me a story of what you've gone through or what you're going through, you know, and, and what the healing journey is for you right now. You know, perhaps your focus right now is on physical healing. Perhaps it's healing an old emotional wound. You know, it might be working out trauma from early life. It might be exploring triggers and coping habits you know, that aren't serving you now, that are limiting you now, that you're becoming conscious of now and ready to work on now to become more free, to become more free. Yeah. You know, maybe it's, it's forgiveness. I've had a nice practice of forgiveness in the last, you know, few weeks, a more complete forgiveness to release what no longer serves your best life. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe it's healing in a relationship. There's a there's an inspiring man I just discovered this week. Actually, now I want to get his um, books, but his name's Jerem Sawatsky. You may have heard of him. He he writes a lot about the healing journey, and he's got a book, Dancing with Elephants. And you know he describes how he was diagnosed with Huntington's disease. And, you know, he was a university professor and he had to retire at 41. And he said that healing is not the absence of the storm. Healing is the way we ride it. And I just, I just feel like that is so, uh, there's so much wisdom in that. Healing isn't the absence of the storm. Healing is the way we ride it, the way we ride the storm. And, you know, his insights describe how healing isn't necessarily getting better, but it's about feeling whole, feeling whole, and letting go of everything that isn't us, and fully becoming ourselves, you know, and our, our truly beautiful human and divine self. So we dance with the elephants in the room, right? We dance with the elephants in the room. We dance with the brain tumor. We dance with the past trauma. We dance with that difficult person, you know, that's hard to forgive instead of avoiding or repressing or being terrified by it. We meet it, we engage it, we embrace it, and we dance with it. You know, and, and sometimes our healing journey does mean getting well. Sometimes it does mean getting well. In, in our unity tradition, one of the most inspiring stories of the journey to wholeness is Myrtle Fillmore's, you know, one of the co-founders of unity. Um, this unity tradition exists in large part because of the intense healing experience that she had. And then she inspired, you know, people around the world um, for many years. 
know, as, as many of you know, Myrtle um, was sickly as a child and a young adult. She had tuberculosis. And she inherited the belief that the world offered her that she was an invalid, always going to be an invalid. And I thought, what an interesting word, invalid, invalid. You know, it's an interesting um, word, you know. And so, you know, it was like a bolt of lightning struck when she went to a New Thought lecture, it was 1886, and she heard the statement, I am a child of God, and therefore I do not inherit sickness. She took that simple divine idea um, that she was beloved of God, you know, that, and that God's will for her was well-being, every manner of well-being. She put her full faith and attention on that truth. And she healed herself, and she gave her life then to supporting others in their healing journey. In her book, uh, Myrtle Fillmore's Healing Letters, she, she shared five ways. She shares a lot of ways, but there's five ways that I kind of, you know, um, extricated from her teachings. That ways that we heal ourselves that I think are really worth exploring. She said that to follow the principles of truth and be healed requires more than simple prayer. What is required that one mu is that one must engage in regular spiritual practices that encompass mind, body, and soul. And so, you know, she placed a lot of importance on the idea that we have to unite all areas of our life. She said daily, daily, declare that your spiritual life and world, your mental life and world, your physical life and world, are unified, and that you are expressing harmoniously the ideas of the Christ mind on these three planes. You know, our mind is, our mental state hugely affects whether we feel good overall. It affects our emotions, it affects our bodies, it affects our health, right? You know, for me, my, my mind, my mental well-being is nourished by meditation, by walking in nature, by prayer, and by the right kind of mental food, right? Mental food. Good, good mental food, like um, inspiring books, inspiring Dharma talks, inspiring music, the company of wise friends, um, you know, inspiring movies that bring me joy and uplift me. That's, that's good mental food. And I, I try to minimize the mental junk food, right? The mental junk food, the negative stories, you know, too much, too much depressing news, right? And, and violence in movies. It's challenging sometimes to find movies that are, have no violence, right? But there's a way to mitigate the difficult news in the world. I don't like to live with my head in the sand. I like to pay attention. <coughs> but then sometimes I need, I need to mitigate the difficult news, right? So Charles Fillmore, um, in the 12 powers that he talks about, he mentions elimination. That's one of the 12 powers. And we can apply that to mind, um, to mind food. You know, if we've taken in something mentally disturbing, if we've had an experience that's mentally disturbing, it's almost like we need a mental laxative to eliminate the mental unease. You know, so that means you know, taking in something purifying, taking in something that returns us to a state of inner peace. You know, listening to uplifting music, to me, or playing it, <laughs> that cleanses and purifies our minds. Um, I love sacred chants, whether I listen to them or sing them, you know. Charles Filmer, I was hearing uh, before service that uh, he's got this great quote. He wrote, you can drive away the gloom. <coughs> if you would please mute. Thank you. Everybody, please mute. Uh, Charles Filmer wrote, you can drive away the gloom of disappointment by resolutely singing a sunshine song. Through the vibrations of the voice joined with high thinking, every cell in the body is set into action. And not only in the body, but out into the environing thought atmosphere, the vibrations go and break up all crystallized conditions. 
So, you know, our spiritual well-being is deeply dependent on our mental well-being. You know, we need to be aware of when we need like a mental car wash, right? Where we need to purify our mind of a lower vibratory thought energy. You know, uh, for many years I would go to India um, once a year and I'd spend a month at the ashram and we would do spiritual practice all day and evening. I mean, it was just, it was all day and night. And um, when I would get home from that month, I would feel so purified. I mean, my mind would be so still and I would just feel such a deep level of peace. So spiritual practice really brings results if, you know, if we're committed to it, if we give ourselves that. I highly recommend some kind of deeper spiritual retreat at least once a year, a few times a year. <coughs> and then the other thing is, you know, taking, taking care of our physical life, as Myrtle was talking about. You know, what is it that brings our physical body attunement to receive the highest vibrations? Yoga, I think, is one one of the greatest things we can do. I know when I would go to India, I would do yoga every day. But also, you know, the food that we eat, um, besides mental food, physical food, you know, we need to eat food that is life-giving, and we need to eat the right amount. You know, sometimes, you know, we feel anxiety, and so we eat to comfort ourselves. Have you ever uh, done that? <laughs> You know, and that that can actually result in feeling more out of balance. You're eating because you're out of balance, and then <coughs> you're not eating mindfully, so then you're more out of balance. So mindful eating is just another way we become more conscious, and we learn we learn to shift from the habit of eating when we're anxious to making a better choice, a more loving choice for ourselves, like listening to a meditation for calming anxiety or taking a soothing long bath. And then Myrtle talks about rest. Rest is essential. I know Ganga Ji used to always say, rest is a holy word. Um, I like to, living across from Lithia Park, I like to take my camping hammock over there and tie it between two trees. And right now, just gaze at all the colors, just gaze up at all the trees and their, their beautiful changing colors. But Myrtle talks about resting from the world for moments of spiritual renewal every day. You know, 20 minutes in a hammock does wonders for your body and your emotions and your mental state. And of course, our body needs exercise. I know I'm preaching to the choir here, but um, I, think our, our, I think walking is one of the best exercises because we can easily also make it a spiritual practice, a mindfulness practice of being in the moment. When I walk in the park every day, I very intentionally, most of the time, go alone, so I'm not talking, so I'm not out of the present moment. And I, I feel like all of nature is wanting to offer me renewal and gifts. And so I breathe and I notice the air. It's very humid because it's by the creek. And I notice the the smell of fall, and I, I feel the earth, and I plant lotuses with each step. It takes some time to do that, so I'm connecting with the earth. And I just feel that the forest is gifting me with peace. It wants to gift me with peace, and it's important that we are receptive to the gifts that are here, that are available, that bring us peace. The ocean, my goodness, gives us so much peace. It the ocean um, reminds us to have this vast open mind, not this world of our little problems and ruminations, but this vast open mind, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So the elements of mental, physical, and spiritual well-being go together. Um, balance. Balance is something to really explore. Is your life in balance? Because the more in balance we can we can be and we can live, it, it makes us healthier, it makes us happier, it makes us more conscious. There's an affirmation uh, from Louise Hay, my mind and body are in perfect balance. I am a harmonious being. It's a wonderful affirmation. 
The second idea that Myrtle mentions is having immense faith that you can be healed or that you can become whole, right? Um, you know, when she, uh, she was asked what restored her health, her vigorous health, um, she said she changed her mind from the old, she called it carnal mind that believes in sickness to the Christ mind of life and permanent health. And she blessed her body often. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But it wasn't just a one-off prayer or a moment of faith. It was, it was cultivated affirmative prayer. It was consistent. It was daily. And it was a firm resolve in believing in her innate spiritual power that with God all things are possible. It's wise to create affirmations that have meaning uh, for, for you. You, know, you could say, God's healing power is at work in me now. Divine life renews every cell in my body. Every cell is oh so very well. <laughs> I am open and receptive to the healing love of God within, within my every genius cell. Um, the third idea that Myrtle talks about is to evolve the old idea that God is outside, you know, and that you have to beseech this unseen faraway God for healing, that God up on the cloud. You know, and she said, instead, pray to the God right in your midst, right in your being that frees and heals. She said, you need to think of God, the all-powerful healer, as being already within you in every part of your mind, heart, and body. You know, God consciousness is every cell. Every cell is that. And then the fourth idea um, is to be optimistic. You know, our optimism, our positive thoughts help um, replace old ways of think thinking, and they quicken healing. Myrtle said, prayer is an exercise to change our thought habits and our living habits. When our thought energy is ex bended in negative beliefs and feelings, we get those old negative results. You know that song that I was sharing that Bonnie Raitt wrote about the woman who felt that she was somehow to blame for her son's death or partially to blame. You know, she just had all this guilt and, and self-blame and shame that she lived with. And she convinced herself that she didn't deserve to be happy or to have any peace. And so she really lived in that black hole of grief for many years and then when this young man came, who was alive because of her son's heart, you know, being donated to him, and he was saved, and he had this life, and he was so grateful to her, you know, all of that changed her mind. And that, that grace of that gave her faith again that she was worthy of peace. And so, you know, we have to explore, and sometimes it's unconscious or subconscious, these old ideas that might be very buried in there, that we don't deserve happiness. Like maybe somebody told us that, maybe a parent told us that. And that old guilt and that feeling we don't deserve happiness, that will unconsciously create things in life to match that belief. So we have to extricate, um, do a really deep cleaning of the subconscious and, and, and get those old beliefs out. That's a huge, huge part of healing, right? And examine, do we believe we are a beloved child of the universe and that we deserve love and happiness and healing and every measure of well-being? Can we embrace that? Can we believe that? Can we know that? And then the fifth thing, um, as I mentioned earlier, is to bless our body, you know, to express gratitude for our body regularly. A Myrtle says our first duty then is to bless our body, to praise its wonderful work, to learn what its needs are, and to supply them, supply them. You know, blessing and loving our bodies is, it's just such an essential part of being the love we are. You know, we can't, we can't be an embodiment of love and leave our body out, right? Our body has intelligence in every cell. It has feeling in every cell. It responds to love and appreciation. It responds to blessing and thanking it. You know, a simple way that I bless my body is after a bath or shower, I put on lotion. 
And, you know, as I'm putting on lotion, I'm very kind to my body, and I thank it. I thank every cell. I thank my skin. I, I thank my organs for working so hard for me. And it's just, it's an act of self-care and self-love. And this might be, you know, our healing journey, is to grow in self-love, to be kind to ourselves instead of judging, you know, our, our wrinkles, right, when we look in the mirror. And honor how good our body has been to us and is to us. You know, it's, it's housed our soul all these years. It's given us the experiences of the joy of dancing and singing and hugging and swimming and climbing mountains, right? So this habit of blessing our body is a way we grow in self-love, self-regard, and heal old habits, right, of self-judgment. And that's a big piece of, of healing, our healing journey. So the last thing I want to mention um, that's so essential for healing is forgiveness. You know, I told you my story when I was there last month of having a not-so-great interaction with my landlord um, in that he didn't believe me when I said I was getting sick from a sewage vent pipe here in my apartment that was leaking this toxic smell and gas into the room. And, um, you know, and then finally the plumber came and he said, yeah, there's, there's a big hole. We'll fix the hole in the pipe and you'll feel better. <laughs> and, um, you know, I have to admit I was disappointed that I did not, you know, get the apology that I was hoping for. But I saw a quote and it read, life becomes easier when you learn to accept the apology you never got. <laughs> I love that. Life becomes easier when you learn to accept the apology you never got. So I let go of being attached to an apology. And instead, I just visualized and prayed for peace between us, between myself and the landlord. And earlier this week, I had an interaction with him in the laundry room that felt like the beginning of healing. And I thought to myself, wow, that visualization, that worked. I mean, it worked really fast. Um, Byron Katie said, forgiveness is just another word for freedom. Forgiveness is just another word for freedom. And that, that really feels true. That so resonates with my heart. So in closing, um, I just encourage you to take some time in meditation and ask, what is my present healing journey? You know, what would make me feel more whole? And make a resolve and a plan to give that desire for wholeness time every day. You know, I'm, I'm here to support you in that journey, you know, in that movement towards greater wholeness. We are walking each other home towards greater wholeness. So um, may you and may all beings be at peace, and may we feel a fulfilling sense of wholeness, of holiness, and may we be filled with all manner of well-being on every level, and may we be happy. Thank you.